In this screencast, I want to go through a couple of examples where we try to come up with the formula that basically reflects the time complexity of the algorithm. That formula is going to be a function of the problem size. And what do I mean by the problem size? Let me just give you a simple example, um, and you'll build up your intuition over time. It's basically, for sorting, it's going to be the number of items. And you can think of that as how much space the problem is going to take up is going to be a very simple function of the number of items, and it's going to go up linearly with that. So that's a good measure for the problem size. Then we need to identify the algorithm's basic operation. So for sorting, it might be comparison. How do we pick the basic operation? By looking at something that's going to be representative of how long the algorithm is going to take. Um, and so if you look at most sorting algorithms, the thing that's really going to drive um, how long they're going to take is going to be compa the comparison operator. The next thing is to decide whether you're going to do the worst average or best case. Now, if um, the number of times the basic operation has to execute doesn't depend on, say, the order of the input, then those three cases might be all be the same. But for sorting, for instance, and we'll talk about insert sort later, um, it very much depends on uh, what the order of the input list is, and, um, and you'll see that the performance depends a lot on that. So, and generally, speaking, we're going to be interested in the worst case behavior because that's what uh, people worry about in real applications. Then we need to find a formula. So in step three, we're basically just counting and trying to come up with some relation that tells us what the uh, number of times is going to be for, to execute the basic operation. And so this formula is um, gives us either usually a summation um, if it's an iterative algorithm, normally, and, or a recurrence relation, and normally you get those when you have a uh, recursive uh, algorithm. And then finally, we want, a, we want a simple formula that tells us the number of times as a function of the problem size. So in the sorting, we'd want a simple formula that is a function of n, which is the, what we're going to use to measure the problem size, the number of items. So let's look at an example. Um, we want to look at selection sort. Um, that's a fairly straightforward, naive sorting algorithm. Um, and the way selection sort works, I'll remind you, is that we take the list here, and we look through the whole list and find the smallest element. So here, that smallest element would be 4. Then we put that smallest element, we swap it with what's in the position where it should go, um, and so we put the 4 as the first entry in the list and 7 as the next entry in the list. Then we search through the remaining elements. Okay, and we find that the smallest element is 5, so then we swap the 5 with the element that's in its correct position, which would be the second position here. And so we'd have 5 here and the 7 would go back where the 5 was. Uh, then we search through the remaining elements. 7 is uh, the next element. Um, so we just swap the 7 with the 9, then 8's the next element, we just swap 8 with that, etc. So here's the, some pseudocode for selection sort. Um, you can see there's this outer loop. The outer loop is going to uh, find the smallest element in the list of the, un the remaining list of unsorted elements. So in the first, when i is equal to 0, it's going to go through the whole list. Um, and then this inner loop is the search, basically, for the smallest element right here. Okay, so that's in our friend's selection sort. Now I want to analyze the performance of selection sort. Um, usually with iterative algorithms and nested loops, what you want to do is you want to start from the inside, so this interior loop, and find out how many times uh, the, this inner loop is going to uh, have to execute um, based on i in this case, so based on the value of the index for the outer loop. So if i is equal to 0, then this would be equal to 1, um, and so the loop would go from 1 to n minus 1. 
Notice this always get this comparison is going to get executed always. Um, so you'll do n minus one comparisons the first time through the loop. Um, then the next time through the loop, I will be equal to one. So you'll do n minus two comparisons, etc. So the number of comparisons down here is going to be one up through n uh, up through n minus one, the sum. Um, just a little aside here, I already mentioned uh, the number of elements storage needed um, and that we're going to use the comparison operator. And notice, now that we've had a chance to look more carefully at the code, uh, the best case, worst case, and average case are all going to be the same. It doesn't matter at all. You're always going to do this loop uh, from i plus 1 to n minus 1. Um, you're going to do a comparison for every value of the index. You never, you never ignore that comparison. So hence the number of comparisons are going to be n minus 1 plus n minus 2 all the way down to 1. And then the closed form solution, well let's look at that on the next page and I'll make some comments about that. So here we just have written down carefully, so you have it in your notes, um, what we just went through. When i is equal to 0, n minus 1 comparisons, i equals 1, n minus 2, all the way down to when it's n my i is equal to n minus 1, then um, I'm sorry, n minus 2, then j goes from n minus 1 to n minus 1, and there's one comparison. So you get this summation. If you look it up, that's the sum of an arithmetic sequence, and you just get that that's n minus 1 times n divided by 2. So you can see from a computational complexity viewpoint, this is going to be order of n squared, ignoring the constants and lower order terms. A slightly more interesting algorithm is insertion sort. Insertion sort, the idea is a little bit different. Um, what you're going to do is grow, again, it grows the area of sorted items uh, one at a time as you go through each iteration of an outer loop. But now it doesn't go through the whole list to find them in. It only goes and looks at the next element that's not in the proper place, the first element that's not in the proper place, and decides where to put it. Okay, so here we just focus on 4, compare it with 7, which we know one element is always sorted, and then 4 is less than 7, so we move the 7 over where the 4 was, put the 4 in there. Okay, so the next step would be the 9. Nine's in its proper place. We just compare 9 to 7, and we don't have to do any extra work. Uh, we just stop there, 9's in its right spot. Then we go to 5. 5 is less than 9, so it's not in the right spot. So what we would do, uh, well, there's more efficient ways to do this, but what we're going to do in the, that's in the pseudocode here is we're just going to swap the 2. So we put the 9 here and then the 5 here. Then we compare the 5 with the 7. 5 is less than 7, so we swap those two. And we end up, and then 5 is greater than 4, so we stop. So we get 4, 5, 7, 9. And then finally, 8. We do 8. Uh, now it's out of order. We do comparison with 9, move the 8 over there, and then 9 over there. So this picture down here gives you a good idea of what the, what the, what the algorithm is doing. You have the sorted partial result. Okay? Then you've got the first item which has not been considered yet, is unsorted. And then you, as long as the item is less than the elements in the sorted order, you just keep moving. And then finally, uh, when you find when it's greater than or equal to an element, then you stop and sort it there, and you will have moved all these items over by one. Here's the code for that. In this code, you'll notice that the inner loop depends very much on the ordering of the data. So if the data is in sorted order, for example, then aj will be bigger than or equal to aj minus 1. If it's bigger than or equal to aj minus 1, then you won't go in to uh, do this uh, swap. And in fact, you'll just drop out of the loop. So that will short circuit, if you will, the number of comparisons. So um, for instance, over here, when we're looking at where the proper place for 5 is going to be, uh, we compare it to 9, we compare it to 7, uh, and we compare it to 4, and so we get, basically do all the comparisons. Whereas here with the 9, 
um, when we're considering the 9 as being the first thing out of order, we compare it to the 7, and 9 is indeed bigger than uh, 7. And so we actually, that's the only comparison we do. We only do one comparison there. So when it's in sorted order, this inner loop uh, for each value of i is going to only do one comparison. It will never, it will always fail, um, so it will only do the one comparison that checks whether to go on or not, and it will always drop out. So for the best case for sorted order, you can see that we're only going to be doing one comparison here each time. So let's see what the implications of that are. Well, here we are, um, and in the uh, best case, since you're only going through doing one comparison uh, here, and you never actually execute the loop because you don't have to change the ordering at all, uh, you're going to basically do n minus 1 comparisons. So in the best case, n minus 1 uh, is the number of comparisons, and there's no, no work to have, to have to do to get the closed form solution for it. In the worst case, you'll, you should stop and think about it and convince yourself that, in fact, you're going to do the same number of comparisons that you did with selection sort. So in the worst case, insertion sort is going to be order n squared. So that's really all I want to spend on in this screencast. I do want to just mention something that we won't have time to go into right now, and that is um, insertion sort. You might wonder, how, are, how can we be sure that it's correct? I mean, it's relatively intuitively, it seems like it's certainly correct. Well, there's a way that's uh, sort of standard um, way to approach iterative algorithms, and that is you look for what's called a loop invariant. Um, and the loop invariant is something that should be true right at the top of each execution of the loop. Um, so for insertion sort, uh, it's that the first i items are in sorted order. Um, and so when i is equal to 1, if you go back and think about a picture, when you've only got one item, it's in sorted order. When i is equal to 2, Okay, then you will have gone through this loop once, and it will have put the first two items in sorted order, etc. Um, and then what you have to do, of course, is show that, and so you need to consider an inner loop, and that uh, means that each time through the inner loop, you can think of what the uh, loop invariant might have to be, and it would be that w one more position uh, an item has moved one position closer to its proper location for the first i items. Again, that's just a very high level, give you some intuitive idea about how you might go about proving correctness. Next, uh, next screencast, we're going to talk about recursive algorithms.